Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I want to step back for a moment and, and think about some of the big picture things in the Bible. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Genesis 1.1 gives you the framework for understanding the rest of the Bible. It divides creation into two regions, the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 begins to talk about the earth. Genesis, all the way through Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the early part of the book of Acts, is all about what God is going to do to reclaim the earth. In other words, think of it this way. Genesis 1-1, God creates everything there is to create. He creates the heaven and earth. Now he's going to I, I, I should rephrase that. In, in 1 1, it, it's a summary statement of him created the heaven and the earth, and then you read in Genesis 1 some of the details of, of what he creates. We know that what then happens is he has to deal with rebellion in his creation. Who is the first rebel? Satan. Satan. And where does he first rebel? Heaven. But after he rebels in heaven, what does he do next? He comes to earth and he leads a rebellion on earth. When does the rebellion on earth start? Genesis 3, right? Now the serpent was more subtle. So as of Genesis 3, the basic problem in the universe is although God created the universe perfectly... There's been rebellion. That rebellion started in heaven, but then it expanded to earth, and both areas are in revolt. So the question becomes, what is God going to do about it? So what is God's plan for resolving the rebellion on the earth? Well, he's going to call out a particular man, and who is that? Abram. And when God calls out Abram, he makes a specific promise. What is Abram and his seed going to inherit? The earth, and well, look with me at Genesis 13. Genesis chapter 13. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, and eastward and westward. Verse 15. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. So the promise to Abram is he's going to receive that land, and how much of it? All that he can see, right? He looks in all four directions. And how long will his seed possess that land? Forever. So when you get out to the future, and the universe is divided into the new heaven and the new earth, where will Abram and his seed be? You have only two choices. They're going to have to be on the new earth, right? Because God promised them the land, and and Abram and his seed were going to dwell in it forever. So what we see as early as Genesis 13 is God reveals what he's going to do to deal with this rebellion. The nation of Israel is going to inherit the land forever. That deals with the rebellion on the earth. What is God going to do about the rebellion in heaven 
And you can answer using any verse you want except Romans to Philemon. So tell me what's going on. And of course, what's the answer? You don't know. Because it's, it's not told. It's not revealed. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Do you ever feel as you read certain verses that the verses are there, they're plain, it's obvious what they mean, and yet they are routinely and widely ignored by nearly all of humanity and most of church of Christendom, right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Notice the next phrase. Even the hidden wisdom. So that verse gives you a definition of what a mystery is. A mystery is wisdom that is what? Hidden. It's been concealed for a period of time until it's revealed. Now notice the next part of the verse, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So when did God come up with the mystery? Did he come up with it in the middle of the book of Acts when he looked out at the universe and said, wow, things have not played out how I had hoped. This is shocking. I better call plan B. Is that what happened? Or is it something that God had ordained before the world? He always knew it was going to happen. The fact that it was new information to man did not mean it was new information to God. He'd always purpose to do this. Now look at verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew. Who are the princes of this world in verse 8? Option A is Prince Charles, B is Harry, C is Fergie, and D is Satan and his minions. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Kathy wins. It's obviously not talking about human princes, is it? Now look at the rest of the verse. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Get Luke 22. Luke 22 and verse 3. Luke 22, verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Luke 22 is right before the Lord is about to be betrayed. What Satan does is Satan enters into Judas. You can decide if this is true. It seems to me what's happening is this. Satan has a purpose he wants to accomplish. He looks at humanity and says, you guys are a bunch of incompetent imbeciles, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this myself. Right? Judas, you ought to be able to take care of this on your own, but I don't trust you, so I'm going to enter into you to make sure that my desires are carried out. Luke 22 establishes that Satan was in favor of the cross, doesn't it? Satan enters into Judas specifically to accomplish that purpose. But now how do we reconcile Luke 22 verse 3 with 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8. Because 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8 says that had the princes of this world known the mystery, what would they not have done? They wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. So what that tells us is the mystery information had to have been hid from Satan and his minions, right? If they'd known it, they would not have been in favor of the cross. Okay, so this information must be of incredible importance. So what is the mystery information that Satan didn't know? 
the body of Christ. That's right. Now, the way this is often preached, I don't know if you have ever heard preaching like this. Maybe you have. People will sometimes say, on Easter morning, Satan was shocked because, what do they say? The Lord arose from the tomb, and he was surprised. Now, is that true? Look with me at John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 19. Is John 2 before the cross or after the cross? Before. John 2, 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. When the Lord was referring to a temple there, what temple was he talking about? Excellent. So he's clearly talking about the cross, and he's clearly prophesying the resurrection far in advance of when it happened. So, did Satan know about the resurrection before it happened? He had to, right? John 2, the Lord specifically speaks of it. So, the mystery that had Satan known he would not have crucified the Lord of glory cannot be the resurrection because the resurrection was not a mystery. Right? Was the mystery that Satan didn't know the redemption of the nation of Israel? Get Matthew 1. So let me rephrase the question. Was it a secret? Was it a mystery that the Lord Jesus Christ would die for the sins of Israel? No. Get Matthew 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So was it clear before the cross that Jesus Christ was going to die for the sins of Israel? Absolutely. What was not clear, what was not understood at this point, was the body of Christ. Why does Satan care one way or another about the body of Christ? Get with me Daniel 10. Daniel chapter 10. Now in Daniel 10, Daniel receives a visit from the angel Gabriel. And Daniel prays, and it takes a little bit of time before he receives this message from Gabriel. I want you to notice verse 21. What Gabriel says in verse 21, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Gabriel is going to reveal some information to Daniel, and he does that. And he makes the comment that there is none that holdeth with me in these things. There's none who agree, except for who? Michael. What that tells you is this. When the satanic rebellion occurred. So Satan rebels in heaven before he starts the rebellion on earth. When he starts the rebellion in heaven, he then seeks to get other angels to follow him. 
Are there other angels that follow him? Yes, there are, quite a few. Does anyone have a, an estimate as to roughly how many followed him? Good. How do you know that? Is there a verse that says that? Maybe you saw that on TV? You read it on the internet, so you know it must be true? What's the scriptural support for that? Revelation chapter 12. The Bible's an interesting book. The way you know that roughly one-third of heaven followed Satan in his rebellion, you can't read in Genesis, and you can't read in the Old Testament. You don't really find the evidence of it until Revelation chapter 12. And God has the ability to write things like that because he knows the end from the beginning, and he can choose to record things where he wants them to be recorded. There's no book like this. Look at Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Look at verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now let's understand where we are on the chart. In Revelation 12, we're looking at events that occur during the middle of Daniel's 70th week. So Daniel's 70th week lasts for seven years, and it is divided into two sections, the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years. Which of those two divisions, the first half or the second half, which one of those is referred to as the Great Tribulation? The second. And why is the second worse than the first half? Satan is cast out of, uh, out of heaven. He's down to the earth. And what did we just read? He has great what? He has great wrath. And what is the reason that he has great wrath? You know that the time is short. What happens, obviously, so Revelation 12, 7 said there was war in heaven. The leader who fights against Satan and his minions is Michael, right? That's what Revelation 12, 7 said. And it's described as a war. So does Satan oppose Michael? He does. Obviously, Satan loses. I would suggest to you the following metaphor is relevant. In war, is it important which ground you fight from? It is, isn't it? You want to have the superior position, preferably the, the higher ground, right? Well, what happens in Revelation 12 when this war in heaven occurs? Satan and his minions <laughs> are cast out of heaven... They're cast down to the earth, and Satan has an awareness, doesn't he? The time is short. Now, you may remember this. What happens in the Gospels when the Lord deals with the legion? Does anyone remember the legion? They ask him a question. Does anyone remember what the question is that they ask him? What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus, Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? What a fascinating way to end that question. When they say, art thou come hither to torment us before the time, what are they revealing? 
They know there's a time of torment, and they know when it's going to happen, don't they? Well, does Satan know that there's a time of torment? And does he know when it's going to happen? And does he know when the time that remains is very brief? It's exactly what's going on. Now, in Revelation 12, verse, in chapter 12, look with me at verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Notice verse 4. This is the verse, in my opinion, that tells you that a third of the angels in heaven follow, follow Satan. I don't, I'm not aware of another verse. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So Revelation 12.4 is the scriptural support for the idea that one-third of the heavenly host followed Satan. So now we need to reconcile a different thing. In Daniel 10.21, Gabriel said, There is none, that's the word he used, There is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Well, doesn't that sound like two? In other words, Gabriel and Michael. There's none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So there's, it's only the two of us? Well, but it can't be only the two of us if there's only one-third of heaven that falls, right? I mean, that would obviously be the case. So what's going on in Daniel 10, 21? What I would suggest to you is this. What Gabriel is saying is that the satanic rebellion affected the principalities, the powers, the higher ranks of the heavenly host. And of those higher ranks, what did the vast, vast, vast majority of them do? They went to the wrong team. Let me ask you a question. Do fallen angels have a second chance? And why or why not? So do fallen angels have a second chance? Do they have a way to be redeemed? They don't. Why is it that they don't? What's the reason? Because God is grumpy? Get Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Verse 35. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more. So can you die in the next life? Not possible. Notice what it says. For they are equal unto the angels. So notice carefully how verse 36 is phrased. Neither can they die any more, colon, for they are equal unto the angels. What happens in the next life is that redeemed saints, people that are believers that are redeemed, there's been a, a shift that happens, and you are now what? Equal unto the angels, and since you're equal unto the angels, what can you not do? You can't die. Look with me at Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. How was he made a little lower than the angels? He took upon himself human flesh, didn't he? He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. So Hebrews 2.9 and Luke 20, 35 and 36 tell us some interesting things. What is the gap between angels and men? Is it huge? How would Scripture describe it? Man is a little lower than the angels. And what is the big difference between angels and men that we can see? Death. An angel cannot die, according to Luke 20, verse 36, but men can die. Why is it that the body of Christ must participate in the adoption prior to going to heaven? So someone tell me the Bible definition of the word adoption. All right, let me rephrase the question. Someone tell me the Bible definition of the word adoption is found in Romans 8.23. That might help. So look at me at Romans 8.23. Romans 8, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, in other words, namely, more specifically, the redemption of our body. So what happens to a believer, in other words, the moment you believe the gospel, you go from being lost to saved. You go from having a dead spirit to having a regenerated spirit. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. But there is one big remaining problem in your person. What is it? It's your flesh, right? Your soul is saved the moment you believe the gospel. Your spirit is regenerated. But your body is the same carnal body that it was before. The reason why God can't allow you to go to heaven without the adoption, the redemption of your body, is what would happen if God put us into heaven without fixing our body. Well, the first thing we'd start doing is sinning, right? And we would corrupt it. Look with me at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 17. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. What's your problem as a believer? Your problem as a believer is your flesh. So, God has a solution to that problem. It's called the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. You get a new body at the catching up, at the rapture, at the adoption. All those things are, are similar. They mean the same thing. Now, look with me at Genesis 35, 18 and James 2. Genesis 35, 18. Genesis 35, 18. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died. 
Get with me James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 26. For as the body without the what? The spirit is dead. So James 2 says that the body is dead without the spirit. Genesis 35, 18, in, in describing Rachel, if my memory is correct, says that she, when she died, what departed? Her soul departed. So in other words, mankind is a three-part being. Body, soul, and spirit. When the body dies, there are two things that leave the body. The soul and the spirit. That is a good description of what happens at death. The spirit and the soul depart the body. The reason at the rapture you get a new body is because the flesh is corrupt. That flesh can't be taken to heaven or it will corrupt a perfect heaven. But what did we learn about angels? Angels cannot die. Well, if an angel cannot die, and death is when the spirit and soul leave the body, what does that tell you about an angel's ability to get a new body? They can't. They don't have the ability to do that. So when an angel rebelled, when an angel sinned, and the angel then had a sin nature, is there any way to fix that? There isn't, because angels cannot die. They are in that body that God originally gave them, and they are in that body forever. So when they sin, and they now have a sinful Nature, there's no way for them to get rid of it. Now, a related proof point of that is the following. The reason that mankind can be redeemed is that Jesus Christ took upon himself human flesh, took upon himself the nature of a man, and he died for the sins of mankind. There's no verse anywhere that says he died for the sins of angels. Get with me Isaiah 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. Pause and consider what that verse is saying. Do the residents of hell, does it become, I don't know if I'd call it a matter of excitement, I don't know how I would put it, but is it news that Satan is going to be cast into hell? They're moved to meet thee at thy coming? Isaiah 14.9 is a description of what happens when Satan is cast into hell. Now look at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? We have this experience in life. Do you ever see someone who has a high, high position status on this earth? 
and they're arrogant and corrupt. And what you want to do is you want to see them humbled, right? Because they're, they're crooked and evil and wicked. Well, that's what verse 12 is saying there. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? You were up in heaven. You were in the anointed chair that covereth. You had all this position and influence. And you're here with us in hell. That's the tenor of what's being said there. Now let's keep reading. How art thou cut down to the ground? You are being in heaven and now you've been brought down to the earth. Which didst weaken the nations. Notice verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, when it says there, for thou hast said in thine heart, they are saying back to Satan, this was your plan. You rebelled, and you said you were going to accomplish A, B, and C, and they're going to read it right back to them. In other words, it's the equivalent of, you claimed you were going to do this. Let's see how it turned out. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. We know what the stars of God are, don't we? From Revelation 12. The stars are representative of what? Angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So there's five I will statements that Satan makes. All of those are not going to happen. All of those will fail. Notice verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. He was going to ascend above the heights of the cloud, put his throne above the stars of the congregation and so on. And what happens? Brought down to hell. Now look at me at Genesis 14, verse 19. Genesis 14, verse 19. The fifth I will statement. Lucifer said, Satan said, I will be like the Most High. Genesis 14, verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. If you notice carefully how Genesis 14 verse 19 is written, the term Most High God is further clarified or defined as the possessor of heaven and earth. You can see the same thing in verse 22. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God. Notice, the possessor of heaven and earth. So let me paint for you the following picture. God creates angels in Genesis 1. At the end of Genesis 1, what does God do? He rests. He ceases from creating, right? Can angels reproduce and create other angels? They can't. God finished creating angels in Genesis 1. So as of the end of Genesis 1, there is a fixed number of angels that will not increase because the angels cannot create new angels and God didn't subsequently create new angels, right? When some of those angels fall, what then happens is they have fallen and they are going to remain fallen, right? Because there is no redemption provided for angels in the scriptures. Those angels that rebelled, have a sin nature, they're not going to be redeemed. So if you're Satan, and let's put yourself right here in Acts 7. 
Satan's original plan was, among other things, I will be like the Most High. When he says, I will be like the Most High, he's really saying what? I will possess the heaven and the earth. He wants to possess both of them. Let's talk about the earth first. What Satan does in, in Genesis 3 is he comes down to earth, and you've probably heard this said before. He, Satan is, is, is the, I'll, I'll say this for purposes of illustration, he's the greatest preacher there ever was. I don't believe that, but let me just say it. He preached to half the human race. He converted 100% of his audience, and his audience then went out and converted the rest of the human race. Isn't that what happened? He preached to Eve, deceived her, converted her to his way of thinking. What did she then do? She went out and converted Adam to their way of thinking, and the whole human race was converted to Satan's way of thinking at that point in time. Wasn't that the case? So from the Old Testament, Satan would understand God's plan to take back the earth, wouldn't he? Right? Because he can see what happens with Abram. In fact, the easiest way to understand the Old Testament and why Israel has endless problems in the promised land is that Satan has an awareness of what God is going to accomplish with Israel and he keeps taking action to oppose it. When Israel goes into the promised land for 400 years, what does Satan do? Yes, he, Satan knew that even though Israel went into Egypt for, four, for 400 years, God's ultimate intent was going to be to bring Israel into the promised land. So what Satan did is he said, this is great. I've got hundreds of years to prepare, and so when Israel is ultimately attempting to enter the promised land, what are they going to bump into? Giants and Canaanites and Perizzites, and he puts all of those people in the land with giants, with fortified cities, so that when Israel tries to take the land, there'll be a, there'll be a fight. Now, is Israel going to have a problem taking the land if God wants them to have the land? No. I mean, the, the, those, Satan won't be able to hold it. But what I'm, my point is, here's what I want you to notice. When you watch the Old Testament play out, does it play out in a way that tells you that Satan has an understanding of exactly what God is going to accomplish? Yes. Now, Satan is not as powerful as God, so Satan's not going to be able to resist him, but the point is he understands and is preparing and acting accordingly, right? Now, let's go back to Acts chapter 7. And you tell me, why the, the following, oh, you're, you're so literal, you're going there. I'm actually just, go with, there in your mind, okay? I'm proud of you, though. You were doing the right thing. If you're in Acts chapter 7, here's how Satan would think about the universe, and tell me where it's wrong if it is. Well, there's a war going on in the universe between God and me, and it's over heaven and earth. And with regard to the earth... I know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to use Israel as the channel of blessing for the whole earth. And what I have done is I have done pretty successfully the job of keeping Israel so enwrapped in idolatry that they won't be the channel of blessing. That's the truth. That is basically true, isn't it? As far as the heaven... I've read Genesis to Malachi. I know what happened in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there's nothing in there about how he takes back to heaven. That's a true statement as well. Now here's the next part. Here's his reasonable inference. There's nothing in there about how he's going to take back to heaven because he's kind of stuck. And the reason he's stuck is this. 
He created a fixed number of angels and then stopped. Those angels can't create new angels. And the leading ones are on my team. The reason why he's so focused on the earth is he has a chance to take that back. But you know what is mine and is going to remain mine is heaven. Because the leading guys are on my team and he can't reconcile them. Christ never died for their sins. There's no way to reconcile them. They're mine. Now tell me where that thinking is wrong. It's not wrong. It's entirely logical. It's entirely reasonable. But of course, what do we now know that Satan didn't know in Acts 7? We know about the mystery, the body of Christ, that Satan did not. Get with me Colossians chapter 2. Now, if you haven't had someone say this to you yet, they will if you keep teaching right division. And here's what they'll say to you. You ready? Well, dispensationalism can't be true because who believes it? Now, is that an intelligent argument? That's like saying, well, Noah's obviously wrong. He only could find seven people on the whole earth that agreed with him. Well, was Noah right? Noah was right because truth isn't determined by majority vote. What people say about dispensationalism is, well, it can't be true because so few people believe it. That, that's just a dumb, dumb, dumb argument. It doesn't make any sense. But let me tell you the reason why so few people believe it. There is a reason so few people believe it. Look with me at verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You know what the cross did? The cross spoiled. What does the word spoil mean? When you spoil someone, you conquer them militarily and you plunder their resources, right? It's the spoils of war. You conquer them, defeat them, and you take everything that they have. So what happened to those principalities and powers, obviously that's Satan and his minions, is they were thoroughly defeated and then they were Everything they had was taken from them. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them what? Openly. Sometimes what happens is when a, an army is conquered, they are publicly marched as a sign of subjection, right? Right? In other words, they're marched in captivity. It's manifest to everyone. This is a defeated foe. Who is the God of this world? 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that it's Satan. Not that Satan owns the world, not that he created it, but he is whom this world has chosen to worship. So if Satan is the God of this world, and Ephesians 2 says he's the prince of the power of the air. So he has the ability to influence the thinking of this world. How does he feel about the mystery? Well, if the mystery was his defeat, his plunder, where the Lord Jesus Christ triumphed over him and made a show of him, what was the word, openly, how do you think he feels about that? He doesn't like it. So is Satan a fan of dispensationalism? No, because he hates the mystery more than anything possible, right? It, it, it's his defeat, it's his loss, it's his humiliation. And the reason why right division is mocked and disbelieved and slandered and misrepresented is who is behind it. The person who is behind it is the person whom the mystery destroyed.
Look with me at Ephesians 3. I don't know about you, but do you ever get the sense that what happens with humanity is that 99.99% of our time is spent on things that really don't matter and are irrelevant to what is really going on in the universe. See, what's really going on in the universe is quite, quite simple. There's warfare between God and Satan over the souls of men. So the souls of men are going to be in one place for all eternity. And anything other than that, candidly, doesn't make much difference. Does it? Doesn't matter who wins any of these games. Doesn't matter who wins any of these wars, to be honest with you. What matters is the souls of men and where they are for eternity. Now look at me at Ephesians 3.9. Ephesians 3.9 is Paul's description of what the body of Christ should be doing. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. If you take 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, and you take Romans 16, 25 to 26, it's clear that, what, that God's will for people's lives is He first wants them to be saved, and He then wants them to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so in order to, to do that, what the body of Christ needs to be busy doing is teaching people about the mystery. Romans 16, 25 and 26 talks about people being established by two things, the, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, how? According to the revelation of the mystery. In other words, to get someone established, and I'll, I'll give you a simple proof here, the way you can tell that nearly no one in the body of Christ is established is through the following example. People will sometimes sit and listen to Christian radio for hour after hour. And there'll be one program on that says A. And the next program says not A. And they listen to them both and they like both of them. Why is that? Because they're not established in the truth. Do you follow me? The only way that you can get truly established is you have to understand the mystery. Now think with me just for a moment about this. What do golfers wear on their feet? Why do they wear spikes? Because what happens, what, what does a batter do when they get into the batter's box? What's the first thing they do? They dig in. Why do they dig in? For the simple reason that if you're trying, what, what do you have to do before you throw a punch? You, you have to set your feet, right? Because you have to have a stable platform to have a, basically a, a, a shift in momentum, a, a shift in energy to deliver a blow. If you're hanging from a thread, you don't have any ability to, to get a foundation to then strike a ball or, or do whatever it is you're trying to do. Well, the vast majority of the body of Christ has never been established. So what do they do? They float around. That's what happens. Now we're in Ephesians 3. Look at the end of verse 9. There's a colon. Verse 9 said to make all men see. Verse 10 says to the intent. This is what's fascinating. You make all men see because you're trying to accomplish an even greater purpose. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Consider what verse 10 actually just said. You make all men see because who else is watching? In 1 Timothy 3.16, doesn't Scripture specifically tell you that the body of Christ is Seen of angels. What are angels doing today? They're watching what the body of Christ does. Look at verse 10 again. 
to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, that's talking about the angelic principalities and powers in heavenly places. That's obviously what it is. Might be known, they're going to learn something by the church, the manifold what? Wisdom of God. Manifold means multiple. When the cross occurs, Satan has an understanding that it will purchase the redemption of Israel, but it will purchase something in addition to the redemption of Israel. And what is that? The body of Christ. See, here's why Satan hates the mystery in simplest form. As of Acts 7, he thinks the heavens are mine. There's nothing in the scripture about how God's going to take them. So they're mine. And then what happens? God saves Saul, gives him the revelation of the mystery, an understanding of the purpose of the body of Christ, and the existence of the body of Christ means God has no further use or need for Satan and his minions. Someone finish this quote. Nature abhors, nature abhors a vacuum. Why didn't God send Satan to hell immediately after Genesis 3, or even after his rebellion in heaven? And the reason he didn't is God was going to allow that rebellion to play out over time because there were purposes that he was going to accomplish. As of Revelation 12, what happens? Satan and his minions are kicked out of heaven, right? So I'm going to suggest to you, here's what happens. During the dispensation of grace, here's what God does. He saves everyone that believes the gospel of grace. The moment you believe the gospel of grace, you're placed into what group? The body of Christ. So you're in the body of Christ, and what's your sole remaining problem? The flesh. So he predestinated you unto a certain event. By the way, in Scripture, predestination is only to one event, according to Ephesians 1 verse 5 predestinated unto the adoption. So in other words, as a member of the body of Christ, you can eat lunch wherever you want to eat lunch. You control that. The one thing you cannot change is you cannot change the fact that you will participate in the adoption. You will receive a new body. So let's look right here. At the time of the rapture, God has determined every member of the body of Christ at the rapture, at the adoption, he has given them their new body. So they have a heavenly body that is spiritual, that is capable of functioning in the heavens for all eternity. What is the next thing that he does? That's right. What happens after the adoption is the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ determines each member of the body of Christ, determines their reward for eternity. Their rewards are sometimes described as crowns, which makes sense if you're replacing principalities and powers because you have to be identified for those assignments. So do you see why Satan hates the mystery? You're the new cute girlfriend. Isn't that it? Satan... You've been allowed to continue to occupy in the heavens because God is going to allow your temptation ministry to continue. But when he forms your successor, the body of Christ, and during the dispensation of grace, he determines who's in it. At the rapture, he gives them their new bodies that will function in heaven forever. At the judgment seat of Christ, he gives them their assignments. And this is my gloss. He turns to Michael and says, make it so. And Michael says, yes, sir. Which Michael's been waiting for that order for thousands of years. So pause there. Do you understand the incredible purpose of your life? 
It's not to watch TV. You're part of the body of Christ. You're part of what God is doing to reconcile the heavens to himself for all eternity. Your purpose is to replace Satan and his minions. And there is literally nothing on earth that has any significance compared to that. And so what our life needs to be about then is we need to tell people the gospel because the gospel is what puts them into the body of Christ. Right? And then we need to teach them right division because they need to understand what their function is. They need to understand there's something different from Israel. They have a different purpose. And I love the fact that Ephesians 3.10 says that as you teach right division, who are you making it manifest to? The principles and powers in heavenly places. The angels that, aren't, that haven't fallen... Look at that and rejoice. And the ones that have fallen, look at that in hatred and fear. Right? God doesn't need us. He's going to get rid of us is what those angels realize. And he's replacing it with these silly creatures made out of the dust of the earth. What an embarrassment! So that's the purpose of the body of Christ. That's the purpose for our lives. I'll I'll close with this thought. I find it's always helpful to, to start with the basics, to start with the fundamentals. You can always overthink things. You can always make them too complicated. But if you start with the basic purpose of, why am I here? What would God have me to do? And you start with that clarity. You then realize that so much of life is all of these things are are worldly distractions that don't don't amount to anything, right? I'm always amazed when people will say, this happens constantly. They'll get elected to some hall of fame, whether it's football or baseball (laughs) or whatever. They'll say, the hall of fame is forever. I'm thinking, well, you do realize... American baseball wasn't even invented until the last couple hundred years. It can't be that eternal. And by the way, the Hall of Fame is a literal hall, right? And that's what it is. I mean, I, I was once in a, you, know, you may find this funny. I was once in a, in a building at, at a college, and I walked through the accounting Hall of Fame. You probably didn't know there was an accounting Hall of Fame. There's an accounting Hall of Fame, and you walk through the hall, and there's little plaques of people that are in the Accounting Hall of Fame. Well, is that forever? Do you think that building's going to endure forever? In 2 Peter 3, when God melts the, the, the heavens and the earth, is he going to exempt the Accounting Hall of Fame from that? See, none of those things have any real endurance, do they? They're all going to pass away. They're all going to melt. So what happens is we often get caught up and bothered by the minutia of life, right? The immediate circumstances that demand our attention, but they just don't really matter, do they? They don't. So praise the Lord for what we have in Christ. Praise Him for the position we have in the body of Christ. Let me, let me close in a word of prayer, and then let, let's stand together and sing. Father God, thank You for Your Word. We thank You that You have revealed to us the mystery. We thank You that we can understand what it is. We pray that each day we would understand it more clearly and that we would be the ambassadors you want us to be. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.